Hello, and welcome to New Beginnings Baptist Church. We are so glad that you've chosen to join us today for this time of worship. My name is Pastor Brian, and our goal here is to help you to know and love God more. We believe that God has something special planned for you during this time. So let's hear from God's Word now. We are going to start a series on the lost parables of Jesus. Now, no, this is not the parables that Jesus forgot about or misplaced or anything. These are the stories that talk about the lost. They were, these were three stories that Jesus told about the lost things that related to the Israelites and, and to the Jews, and they actually relate to us as well. Of course, because Jesus is the greatest storyteller, and these are some of the greatest stories that he does tell. And so we are going to take a look at these parables. Now, I know parables. You probably don't know that unless you majored in English somehow in college, but parables are short stories with a spiritual truth. And Jesus told these stories, very short stories, but they have a very big, significant spiritual meaning. And he told these stories to help us understand who he is as God and what he is doing as Savior. And so we're going to look at these lost parables. There are three of them. I'm, I'm going to give you the cliff note version. That, that's the quick, just summary of them. There are the, there's the lost sheep the lost coin, and the lost son. Now, I'll even go a little bit further. I'm going to go ahead and give you the meaning of each one. The lost sheep wanders away from its master. The lost coin is misplaced, and the lost son simply rebels and chooses to leave the father. And so what this is and what we are connecting here is that Jesus says his purpose and mission, we heard it earlier, that Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And so for that, now we have the premise, the basis of understanding what Jesus is about to say in this short parable about the lost sheep. So follow along with me, Luke 15, starting in verse 1. All the tax collectors and sinners were approaching, and they were listening to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were complaining, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable, what man among you who has a hundred sheep and loses one of them does not leave the 99 in the open field and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and coming home, he calls all of his friends and neighbors together saying to them, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. May God bless the reading of his word. Mm. To get an idea of what Jesus is teaching us here, we need to first think about what it means to be lost. I mean, we over-spiritualize this phrase. As Christians, we, we, it's a churchy word, the lost. It's a Christianese word. You know what that is? It's a whole language that we made up just for us. Okay, I remember when kids were little, they invented their own language and they could talk in this foreign language that was foreign to everybody but them. And they, could, they understood what each other were saying based on their little grunts and made up words and all this. This is a churchy word, the lost, that we have kind of taken and it means something a little, like as Christians, we put a different type of meaning than what just is simply said here. If you think about this, to be lost means to be unable to find your way. 
To be lost means to not know where you are at or where something is at or where someone else is at. The simple definition, why do we have to complicate things? The simple definition is all we need to understand here. When Jesus is talking about the lost things in these parables, he's simply saying these are things that are unable to find their way back to where they need to be. These are things that are, they're, they don't even know where they are at. I started thinking, and of course when you start reading these and you start trying to put yourself in the stories to hear Jesus talking directly to you, you start thinking, well, when have I been lost? When have I been lost? A few of you are laughing because you get lost more than others. So you're used to this idea of being lost. But for me, I think about being out in the wilderness. I am not a person of natural direction when you have me in woods and in mountains and where everything looks the same. I know they tell you that gro the, the moss grows on a certain side of the tree and it can tell you the direction. I don't know what that is. Uh, you can also see the sun and get an idea of which way. Have you noticed, when was the last time you saw the sun here? Yesterday? Yesterday? I must have been not looking. So you have a few moments there for yesterday, for the last couple of months to identify where you're at. Brief glimpses. But for me, I was, uh, you know, as a, as a uh, youth pastor, we would take kids out into the woods a lot, camping. You know, kids camp, youth camp, all that kind of stuff. And we take them out in the woods. And I had to be, as a youth pastor, an adventurous youth pastor. I, I wanted to make it exciting for the kids, right? So I was like, hey, let's go on a hike. It sounds great. It's a great idea. The kids love the idea. Until I realized that about an hour into this hike, I was like, I don't know where we're at anymore. I have no idea where we're going. I don't know where the camp is. I have no idea. And I only took part of the kids. So the rest of the kids are back at camp with other youth leaders. And I'm like, starting to worry. I'm starting to panic. I'm like, how are we ever going to get back? And then I remembered, okay, where we're at, there's a whole bunch of logging roads. If we find a logging road, it will lead somewhere. <laughs> and if we get to the end of the logging road, we'll just go back on the logging road and uh, we'll find some way because logging roads lead somewhere. So that's one experience of getting lost. Another one is another time I was camping and I was out there. It was a men's retreat and I went on a hike all by myself. And this was an all day hike. Like we had the entire day to do this as, as a part of our men's retreat. So I went out there and I'm like, I'm going to just be with God and nature. And, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to listen to God. I'm going to worship God. I'm going to pray. I'm going to study my Bible and stuff. And it was great until about 3.30, I realized I have no idea where I'm at. And they're expecting me to get back because they're going to drive me back to where we're having our men's retreat. And I'm like, yikes, this is scary. So I stopped and prayed and good thing God doesn't get lost because he guided me right back. I, and then I started realizing afterwards, I was like, that was not very smart of me. Like I am in a national forest getting lost. These, there's bears and mountain lions and, you know, lions and tigers and bears, oh my type of thing. And I'm, I'm out there lost all by myself. No one knows where I'm at. And I'm like, this is not good. But I'll tell you, probably the worst time that we got lost and the scariest time for me, we were on a mission trip with youth and we were in a foreign country. And we take our team and, and so there's two of us leaders and we have about, we probably have about 12, 15 kids with us. And we're out there and we're in this town, in the city, in a foreign country and we're wandering around and I was not the main leader. Don't start pinning this on me yet, okay? But I, we're, we're out there, and I'm following this guy around, and I realize he has no idea where we're at. And then I started thinking, I have no idea where we're at. 
And so we were lost in this foreign country. That's the idea of lostness, is not knowing where you're at, not knowing and not being able to find out where you can, where you, where you need to be and where you can get back to where you're, you're found. In this story, if we think about it, it's simply put it, to be lost as human beings means that we cannot define our present state. We don't know where we are in our own life. We can't define our present. What, where are you at in your life? Are you at the beginning, at the end, somewhere in the middle? You hope that you're probably somewhere in the middle and you, you think probably depending on your age, you might be closer to the end, but you really don't know. You don't know if today or tomorrow could be it. You don't know when the end of the book is going to happen. And so to not be able to define our present or to not be able to really think about and plan for the future. Oh, we as human beings, we like to prepare for the future and make plans. How many of you already have va vacation plans for this year? Can I come? Okay, because I, I don't have vacation plans yet. So, but to not know and not, not know our present and not be able to plan for our future, let me, let me give you a different way of thinking about it. Just, just to try not to confuse us more but I really want us to understand what it means to be lost before we start looking at this parable and what Jesus is trying to say. Because all three of these that we're going to study for the next couple of weeks are about being lost. To be lost, we get lost in our own fears. We get lost in our own anxiety. We get lost in our own hatred. We get lost in our own vengeance. And wanting, you know, justice, our version of justice, whatever that means. We get lost in our own illnesses, in our own human condition. We know the frailty of life and we get lost in that idea, lost in that thought, lost in that concept often. Another way of looking at this lostness is to see that in here, Jesus is talking about anyone who is far from God. To be lost means anyone who does not know where they are in relationship to God. We ask this question, if you were to die, where would you go? What would happen to you? To get an idea of where someone is at spiritually. If we're lost, we don't know what life after death is like. We don't have an idea of what that means for us individually. That would give me an idea that that person is lost in this idea of where we are at with God. Jesus seemed to have favorite sayings, and this is one of them. You know, as a gifted communicator, as a master teacher, he had phrases, he had ideas that he would share over and over and over again. I've noticed after teaching and preaching for 30 years, there are certain things that I repeat often. Well, Jesus in his teachings repeated this idea often. And one of them is that, that we are like sheep. We heard many verses already, but there are many more that talk about we are like sheep and that he is the good shepherd. And so if we take a moment, if we take just a second here and think about what that means, that, that we are like sheep and Jesus is the good shepherd, what does that mean? All of a sudden, if we let that idea kind of sit there for a second. We get this whole mingled, mangled idea of the tenderness, the sadness, and even the awesomeness of the situation. If we let that idea that we are like sheep, 
I don't know how many of you have ever spent much time with sheep. Well, <laughs> let's go back. Let's look at our passage here and we'll understand more about sheep in a second. But I want us to see and put ourselves in this story. It's like we're sitting here right at the feet of Jesus hearing this for ourselves. But look first at who else is around. I'm not saying look at who else is around in here or who else is sitting by you if you're watching this at home. I'm saying look in this passage and see that first of all, Jesus is with all the tax collectors and sinners. They were listening to him and that listening was an active intent listening. They were enthralled. They were amazed at him and his teachings. But then there is another group of people, the Pharisees. And so we see these familiar characters. We have tax collectors and sinners. Yeah, Jesus is around them a lot. But then we have the Pharisees. They seem to be around Jesus a lot. And now they're like at the same place at the same time. They're like oil and water. They don't mix very well. But these Pharisees, our familiar characters we love so much, are doing something that they're very, they're very good at doing this. Scripture says the Pharisees were complaining. They're good at that. They were complaining. They were grumbling because Jesus... I love the accusation here. Jesus welcomes sinners and eats with them. What kind of accusation is that? <laughs> well, when they hear when Jesus hears that this is the accusation, Jesus, how dare you eat with sinners and welcome them in? Jesus immediately thinks of sheep. His first thought in response was, yeah, you're just like sheep. I read this article. It was actually on a, a, a farming website. It simply said, the headline was, sheep are stupid, not dumb. <laughs> sheep are stupid, they're not dumb. We think that, like we have heard pastors, sheep are dumb. No, they're very intelligent creatures. I've been around sheep a lot. I have a couple of friends who are shepherds. Like they have herds of sheep. And I've been around them. I've helped them kind of uh, care for them and feed them a few times. And I worked for one shepherd for uh, a couple of years. And so they're, they're, they're not dumb. They know how to get through electric fences. They know how to find the weaknesses of things. They know how to break things. They know how to go and find, if they're determined to get through something, they will get through it. They're stubborn, but also they are, in fact, stupid. You know, when, when you're trying to corral them, when you're trying to lead them to the place that they're going to be cared for and they're going to be groomed and they're going to be nourished and treated with, with you know, it's like a spa treatment for a sheep. But when you're trying to corral them and get them to where they need to be, what do they do? They try to run the other way. They're stupid. They're not dumb. They know what they're doing. They are running away from you. Why? I don't know. Something about seeing you as a predator, something about just not wanting to, to do that at that time. But they're not dumb. They knew exactly what they're doing. There was one sheep that my friend had. And this sheep was the leader of the bunch. There's always one that's kind of like the leader of the, the, the flock. Well, this sheep was so stubborn and so stupid. And I use that word. I know some of you may not use that word in your house, but it's the only word that fits. <laughs> it really is. But this sheep decided they were going to jump through an electric fence. Yeah. Not just once. No, not twice. 
This was every day for a week. This sheep would jump through that electric fence and we would fix it and turn it back on. And, and I know how powerful that fence was. Don't ask me how I know, but I know how powerful that was. And that sheep would do this every single day. It wasn't because it didn't know what it was doing. It was because it was just stupid enough to keep doing it. Shocking. I know. <laughs> so sheep are stupid. They're not dumb. And Jesus compares the Pharisees. And he mentions this with relation to the sinners and tax collectors. That when he thinks about all these people, as a, as a matter of fact, another verse says, Jesus looked on upon the crowds with compassion as a shepherd does for lost sheep. And so Jesus looks at this, and here's what he says. Quick review, cliff notes of the entire parable. Here we go. A hundred sheep. John 14 or John 10, 14 says that Jesus is the good shepherd. He knows his sheep and his sheep know his voice. He has these sheep. He is the shepherd of this flock. And he says, what person among you has a hundred sheep? These are not just some random sheep that are out there. These are sheep that belong to the shepherd. And then Matthew 25, Jesus says that the sheep know his voice and they respond to him. And so this shepherd has a hundred sheep and he loses one, loses them how? How do you lose a sheep? They're big, they're loud, especially when they're hungry. My dad has had a few sheep because he has fr he's the friend with the shepherd at, just like I am. And so he has the sheep sometimes at his place. And when I go over there to visit Man, they, they will make a lot of noise when they want to eat. And you know how many times sheep want to eat? All the time. I don't care if you just fed them. They want to eat more. But how you lose one, it's really not about the shepherd losing them. It's the sheep. Remember, they're stupid, not dumb. They get lost by their own wandering. They stray off. They get distracted. I was reading one uh, shepherd who was writing about how do sheep get lost. Well, they, they, have, a, they have an awesome view of uh, things. They have an awesome vision in one aspect. And then they have terrible vision in another aspect. They, have, they can see almost all the way around them without her turning their head. Because of the way their eyes are. Have you ever looked at the, the sheep's eyes? Their, their, their uh, eyes are different. And so it gives them a wide view of the surroundings so they could see predators anywhere and everywhere without having to move or turn or look somewhere else. But what that means is that if there's something right in front of them, they can't see it. They can see everything else around them. But if it's right in front of them, they have to get really close to it and stare really hard and so then they lose focus. They get distracted. This is what Jesus is talking about. One of these sheep gets lost by wandering away, by, by straying from the flock or straying from the shepherd, gets distracted from what they're really supposed to be doing. And then the shepherd goes off until he finds it. I loved how, that, how Jesus said that. Until he finds that one. That means the shepherd is willing to go where the sheep are. Wherever the sheep gets lost, wherever the sheep is wandering, wherever the sheep is distracted from the things that the shepherd wants him to be doing, that shepherd will go and find him where they are at. It's not the idea of, you know how, I also read this one. I did a lot of reading about sheep this week. Shepherds, when they lose a sheep, they don't sit there and say, sheep, where are you, sheep? They don't stand at the gate and say, here, sheep, sheep, sheep. <laughs> you know, that's just about as, as good as trying to 
I mean, call any other wild animal. You can't call them. You have to go to them. But then I love this. A quick thing is he says that when he finds them, he puts them on his shoulder. He is willing to carry them because often when sheep get lost, they are weary and, and wore out and burdened by the stress of it because sheep feel stress often and they can wear themselves out. And so the shepherd gently and kindly puts the sheep on his shoulder. Now there's another passage that talks about the shepherd doing this for different reasons. But in this passage, Jesus is talking about showing compassion to the wandering sheep. Not trying to discipline it, but to carry the weak and the weary sheep back. Jesus is the one who, as the good shepherd, will carry the lost sheep back to where he needs to be. And then he rejoices, throws a party. There's, I looked into all the original languages. The best I can understand is when he says rejoices, that means he throws bigger than a Super Bowl party. He throws that kind of party over one sheep that gets lost. You know how often sheep get lost? A lot. But then Jesus clearly says, I tell you, there's more joy, more rejoicing. There is a party in heaven over one person who repents than 99 churchgoers who don't need to repent. Remember, all this is teaching us spiritual truth. So let's dive in a little bit deeper here. That was the quick review. Let's go into some of the, the finer study here. I'll make this quick, I promise. Or I should say simple, not quick, because I am me after all. But here, I want you to see Jesus seeks the lost. Jesus seeks the lost. His purpose and mission on earth was to seek and to save the lost. Here, he is the good shepherd and we are the sheep. He seeks the lost. The good shepherd leaves the 99. I know we could go into a lot more conversation about this. Why would you leave the 99? I mean, one out of 99, 1% of your flock is gone and you're worried about that 1%. The good shepherd leaves the 99. Why does he leave the 99? Because they are well cared for. In that day and age, it, when, he's, when he's giving this, he says, what shepherd, owner shepherd, has 100 sheep, does not leave the 99 in the open field. Why? Because that open field is a safe place for them. Plus that, the owner shepherd leaves under shepherds to care for the 99. He doesn't leave them alone. His priority, though, is for the one who has wandered away, the lost sheep. And so Jesus is willing to go where the lost sheep is at. Have you ever really thought about how dangerous this is? I was reading a little bit more. There was a sheep a shepherd was sharing this story. There was a sheep that had wandered off, again, because they were distracted and, you know, they have to get close to an object. And sheep, no matter, even if they're in a field full of green grass, always want to go where they think there's more green grass. Like, they could be in an entire field that they could no way eat all that grass or all that hay or all that food, but they will always go looking for something a little bit better. And this one sheep went looking off, got, got lost straight away. And so much so that they were on a cliff to where the sheep was standing there. And one of their back legs was not even touching the ground anymore. It was hanging off the cliff. And the sheep didn't care. And this was on a, a mountainside. So one side was a huge you know, it was a cliff. So if you fell, you fell a long ways and got hurt. But coming to the sheep wasn't easy either because you had to come down that hillside. And that was a steep hillside. And the shepherd was talking about it. The sheep didn't even realize how dangerous of a situation they were in. 
But the shepherd, the good shepherd, puts himself at risk to go rescue this lost sheep. We don't think about how dangerous this is for the shepherd. But really, in this story, one of the things that jumped out at me was Jesus is expressing not only the lostness of the people he's talking to, but he's talking about the stress and the hurt and the love that the shepherd has for the sheep. We often don't think about this here, but the owner, the shepherd, is hurting over the lost sheep. The shepherd is troubled over the thought of the sheep being in trouble, being in stress, being in, in peril. And that's Jesus. He seeks with an urgency. He seeks the lost with determination. He seeks the lost to rescue those who are in danger, who do not even know it. This explains why Jesus came to die on the cross. He was willing to put himself on that cross to save the lost sheep. Who are the lost sheep in this story? Who are the ones that Jesus is seeking here? Well, first of all, we have the clear answer is He's talking about the tax collectors and the sinners. Now again, this word sinners is a churchy word. It's our part of our Christianese language. But again, if you go back to the original text, if you go back to the way this was used then, in that day and age, this word sinner was not just someone who broke God's law. That's where we use it. Anyone who breaks God's laws is a sinner. But this, in their day and age, was not about breaking God's law. This was the social outcasts. This were the people that were despised and rejected by all of society. And that defines the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the drunks and those who were just, just shameless with their behavior. They were shameless because they were unreligious. They didn't know better. That's what sinners are in this context. The, the Pharisees are saying, how dare you eat and drink with sinners? Sinners were the ones who were not religious. They were simply the ones who broke all the religious laws because they didn't know them. This wasn't about God's laws. This was about their laws. And so again, to bring this back simply to what Jesus is saying, at the time he is saying it, Jesus is saying, these sinners, the ones you have rejected, the ones you, you Pharisees, you people that are supposed to be God's people, you have looked down upon, these are the quote-unquote sinners, these are the ones that I have come to seek, to find with determination. Who are these today? Well, you could go through a long list, and I'm sure we have our own, but this is the homeless, those who are mentally ill, those who are teenage mothers, unwed mothers, who sometimes are kicked out of their own homes and have to bear this idea of getting an abortion or carrying this child by themselves with no help. These are the addicts. These even are, yes, criminals. They break the laws of the land and they have to go serve time. But as society, we don't, uh, if you spent time in jail, you know what, I don't know that you're the kind of person I want to hang out with. As Christians, we have our list of sinners. People who are not like us. If you want to get an idea of who this might be for you, 
Imagine if someone like the list that I just gave came in and were, were to sit down right next to you. Imagine if they were to come in and sit next to you, would you be appalled? Would you be comfortable around them? Would you engage them? Or would you kind of like, ah. You know what? I think it's my time to serve in the nursery. Hmm. <coughs> You know, they did a research on Christians. And you're probably sitting here thinking, I'm not like the Pharisees, Brian. I'm not like them. I, I love all people that are in my life. Well, how many of them are exactly like you are? But okay, I'll get off that, that subject here for a second. Let me just simply show you the results of the study they did a study to see if more Christians are like Christ in behavior and attitude or if we're more like Pharisees in behavior and attitude. And here's the results. 51% of Christians are more like Pharisees. I can't even read how small that is of a percentage that are actually like Christ. So if you don't think this is about us, if Jesus isn't teaching us, you might want to check your heart a little bit more. Because as Christians, we have people who we see as, oh, Jesus, Jesus welcomes those people into here. But not only does Jesus seek the sinners, but he seeks the wanderers as well. Those who wander away. Remember, most sheep get lost because they get distracted. They get, they get something catches their eye over here and they go and check it out. There is a movement of Christians today who are, who are in that same boat of wandering away. There's something over here in society, something over here in philosophy, something over here that's going on in, in culture that catches my eye and it just kind of leads me away just a little bit. Not, not necessarily leaving the faith, but I'm distracted enough that I'm wandering away from God. The biggest one nowadays is something called deconstructionism. And... And I've talked about this, but this term actually comes from a 1967 paper by a psychologist. And so now, if you actually were to look it up, uh, just to give you an idea of how popular of a concept this is, deconstructionism, especially with Christianity, you look at social trending uh, phrases. Uh, if, you're, if you're used to social networking, it's called hashtagging. Well, you look up the hashtag deconstruction and there's over 300,000 hashtags with that as the description. 300,000 people are talking about this online of deconstructing, especially in relation to their faith. And what this is, is showing us that most Christians simply are moral deists. They believe in a God that teaches us to be good and nice and kind, but not the God of the Bible. And so they walk away from the faith because if we understand the God of the Bible and his grace and his mercy and his love and his holiness and justice, I don't see how we could walk away from a God like that. But a God who's just a nice God, yeah. Because trying to deal with life with a nice God just doesn't work. But let me, let me quickly share with you, there's hope. They did another study. Barna is a famous research group. Barna did this study and they, they talked about where we're at spiritually in the United States. I love these results. 
Over 77% of the people said, I believe there is a God or a higher power. 77% of the United States population believes in a higher power. That's an open door for us to talk about God. Okay, we need to celebrate that. But not only that, there are 74% of people who say that they are willing to and they want to grow spiritually. Hello, this is the United States population. And by the way, this was in October of last year. This was only just a few months ago they did this study. Over 74% of the population now wants to grow spiritually. If, if this is not permission for us to engage in spiritual conversations as Christian believers, I don't know what is. I know we think as Christians, oh, there's this society and they don't like us Christians. The research is saying different people. The research is saying that these over three-fourths of the population around us wants to talk to someone about God. But they don't know who to talk to. We just got to get out there and meet them. Not only does Jesus seek the lost, but he loves the lost. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus loves the lost. There is no one to blame but yourself if you die apart from God. There is no one else to blame. You can't blame your parents. You can't blame your spouse. You can't blame the preacher. You can't blame the church. You can't blame society. Why? Because Romans tells us that God has revealed himself to all of us individually. If we die apart from God, there is no other one to blame but you. And that should scare us. But Jesus loves us while we were still sinners to die for us. Let me show you how much he loves you here in this passage. Jesus spent time with sinners and lost people and tax collectors and even the religious rebellious people. He spends time with them. How do we get that? Jesus eats with them. You can't eat a meal and not spend time with somebody. You can't sit down and, and eat even, even fast food. Think about this. How long does it take you to eat a fast food meal? It is fast compared to preparing a meal, sitting down, and having the three course, you know, a salad and soup first, and then we have the, the dinner, and then we have the dessert afterwards. That's more of like, Man, you sit for hours with the person. Even if we were to do fast food, you know, drive up there, order our meal. It comes out in just a few minutes. We sit there and we eat it in a few minutes because we're just that bad with this habit. Even that takes 20 minutes to half an hour. You eat and spend time with somebody you're going to show them that they are important to you. Jesus eats with sinners because he loves them. Jesus accepts sinners. How do we get that? This man welcomes. The original language says he accepts sinners. Jesus receives them as friends, receives them and even invites them to come and eat with him. Revelations 3 talks about this, that Jesus stands at the door knocking and whoever invites him in, he will dine with them. He will love them. He will be with them. Jesus accepts us as sinners, but he loves us too much to leave us there. He wants a better life for us, so he accepts us as a sinner, 
but he also cares for us beyond that. Again, going back to the illustration that Jesus gives where he picks up the sheep and carries it. The sheep that is weary and burdened by the stress of life, Jesus picks it up and carries it and says, there is a better life for you. Come, let me show you. Come to the pasture where I am protecting you and I'm providing for you. Come with me because I love you and I care for you. Jesus bears the burdens of our wanderings. And my question to you is this. If Jesus does this for us, why don't we do it for others? You're like, Pastor, I'm not Jesus. You're right. That's why I'm glad that James chapter 5 tells us something else. Says James chapter 5, verse 19 and 20 says this. My brothers and sisters, if any of you among you strays from the truth and someone turns him back, let that person know that whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way saves a soul from death and covers a multitude of sins. This isn't talking about Jesus turning someone back. This is about us as Christians loving others, loving sinners, loving wanderers, loving people back to God. And God says there's a blessing for us that are willing to go and do the same thing that Jesus is talking about here of turning people back to God. So my my challenge for us is this. First of all, have you wandered from God? Have you been distracted and strayed from the things of God? Have you wandered from God? If so, Jesus is searching for you. He's seeking you passionately to bring you back, to show you how much he loves you and cares for you. If you have wandered from God, Jesus is simply calling and saying, Come back to me. The next question I have for us is this. If Jesus sat and welcomed sinners, how many sinners have you eaten with lately? How many sinners? They may not be like us. But how many of them have you met with Another study I came across said this, most Christians won't talk with or sit with or visit with not one sinner in a month's time. And you can't count just going through a a check stand and say, oh yeah, I talked to a sinner today. No. No. If Jesus cared for the ones who are far from God, why aren't we doing the same thing? 